So I send it to you, and then you. Good, good. We'll do this just in the break. Is that okay? Um, because otherwise, it's a bit of a drag if you have to take all types of notes. So we may do a bit more exercises today, and then perhaps a bit more tomorrow, so that you're not too much uh, in the sleep mode. Huh? So that's that may be part of. So. We looked yesterday briefly at the concepts of hydrogenation, of how the hydrogen-hydrogen bond can get activated, what different options we're having, and um, what I'd like uh, to see now is how can we propagate this in the next few hours into CH bond activation, which is really, at the end, probably the most motivating bit. Can we activate CH bonds, so can we valorize unreactive compounds? Or can we then devise new uh, catalytic reactions based on activation of, of CH bonds? And that's quite the key because typically catalysis or bond activation requires some activity in the bond. So we start from carbon-halogen bonds or carbon-oxygen bonds if we're very brave. But the carbon-hydrogen bond would be the ultimate bond to functionalize. You know, imagine if you can build a very complex molecule by just starting functionalizing benzene or a hexane, and you start up building all your functionality. That would be great. So we go this stepwise. Um, we talked about hydrosylation as an alternative, where here already we have a silicon-hydrogen bond that gets activated. And we'll come to that type of bond activation in a second. And the other way to do that transformation, this overall transformation, is hydrogen transfer. Now, who has done transfer hydrogenation already in the lab? There's a good few, no? You have done. The Beras have done. The <laughs> good, good. So, some of you may, so you may start doing your own stuff as we go through the concepts. This may be all familiar, but then for the others, maybe it's a bit less familiar. It's a very nice reaction, transfer hydrogenation, because it avoids the use of dihydrogen. And the hydrogen handling, at least in the lab, can be a bit problematic because you have work to work with gases, you have uh, high pressure cylinders, so you have to have a bit of a manifold of how, how you store and how you um, um, administer the dihydrogen to your catalytic reaction. Um, transfer hydrogenation is a bit easier because you basically bury your dihydrogen in a, in a molecule that can then uh, dispatch the dihydrogen on demand. And there's different donor sets that... Uh, that's probably the end of the giant lectures, you know. <laughs> well, that's sad. Anyway, I, I continue nonetheless as I don't take it as a, as a higher sign. Anyway, there's no higher science. Uh, so we basically have a donor system that is now not a gas, but a liquid or a solid phase that can produce the dihydrogen as we need it. And the different sources, um, uh, the one that we will focus on particularly is the um, uh, isopropanol, which open dehydrogenation gives acetone. Uh, another one would be form formic acid, which often but not always comes in an azeotropic mixture with triethylamine um, and this open uh, dehydrogenation forms CO2. So this is very nice because it, there's, a, there's a great driving force already by the formation of CO2. The disadvantage maybe is that CO2 these days is a bit of a, a, a tricky product, uh, so we'd like to avoid CO2 principally uh, in the greenhouse gas context. So for huge scale production, maybe we'd like to have a device then that can as well capture the CO2 back. Now the good news about this is that more and more catalysts have been developed that not only do the dehydrogenation of formic acid to CO2, but also the hydrogenation to CO2 back to formic acid. And then you have a very elegant fuel cell. Then you suddenly have, uh, and that's then more in the context of energy, not really on hydrogenation, dehydrogenation, but in generating dihydrogen. If you have a process that can do this reversibly, you can store dihydrogen in formic acid and you can deliver it when you need it in an engine. So that's a very nice concept for uh, fuel cell production. We come to some other CO, uh, fuel cell productions in a second. Um, 
then Hunch is there is a um, device for your compound for storing dihydrogen, which is very biomimetic. We'll see NAD, NADH is working exactly on this couple, but not on the diester, but on a slightly modified system. And then, of course, um, cyclohexadiene is a good dihydrogen source because there's a huge driving force for dehydrogenation through aromatization. Uh, because the resonance energy that is, uh, uh, that, that is gained in dihydrogen loss is driving this reaction. So often this is fairly easy. So that's a very organic, a very apolar dihydrogen source, while up here we're much more in the polar phase. Biology has used this, or dihydrogen, transfer hydrogenation is nothing new to the world. Biology has used this for um, millions of years, basically, and also we see this often spontaneous in the what's called the Tyshenko reaction, where basically two aldehydes react together to form this ester, and formally this involves a hydrogen transfer from one carbon, so from this carbon to that carbon. So one carbon is oxidized, the other carbon is reduced, so that um, disproportionation reaction is basically hydrogen shift from one to the other. Biology uses it all the time. And you'd see already one of the advantages of this uh, transfer hydrogenation, that you can run it either way. So here's an oxidation, so that's a dehydrogenation. Here, this phosphate and the aldehyde are formally oxidized, so the aldehyde is formally oxidized to an ester, and we release a hydride here and the proton from the phosphate to hydrogenate NAD+. So we do the oxidation, we store the hydrogen, and in a totally different um, compartment, the dihydrogen is lost again, or is used again for the um, reduction of pure weight to lactate. So we have here a ketone to alcohol, uh, here dehydrogenation. So the nice thing about this concept is that you can spatially uh, separate things. You can do the dehydrogenation in one place, the hydrogenation at another. So key is that we have, um, if we use isopropanol, which is probably a very useful or one of the more useful together with, I'd say, formic acid, the most useful transfer hydrogenation donor, dihydrogen donor, um, we have a um, we have basically a redox reaction where we have the isopropanol as uh, the oxidant, uh, sorry, as the reductant and the ketone as the oxidant. Then we get your, our, our reduced product that we desire, um, or that, that, that is desired together with the acetone as the uh, byproduct. Now, if you look at this reaction and you look at the redox potentials, you probably see quite easily that this ketone and this ketone have almost the same oxidation potential. And this alcohol and this alcohol have essentially the same oxidation potential. They're not largely different. Okay, it depends on what the R is. If R is electron withdrawing, then this will be hard to, oxi uh, this will be hard to oxidize. If R is donating, this will be easier to reduce. The, the margins are minimal. Uh, so it's very, uh, very small. So electrochemically, we don't have any driving force here. Uh, electrochemically, this is almost a neutral reaction. So how do we shift? You know, this, this would tell us that we, we end up somewhere at equilibrium. But if we want to reduce that ketone to the alcohol, we don't want to end up in an equilibrium. So what is the driving force we've seen in the formic acid? We have a very easy driving force because the CO2 of course, it's a gas, it's released, so everything goes from the left to the right. So how do we push this reaction to the right? What do we have as options to, to, to derive this reaction? That's a question. So, what would you do? Uh, you have isopropanol, you have the ketone, you know that Electrochemically, you have no difference. So first, the potential will be very small. So likely, if, if you don't do anything, the, um, the, 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 the reaction will be slow electrochemically. So you have to push it a bit. You end up in the balanced. So how do you drive this reaction? Because you're interested in this product. Eh? So we want to do a reduction. So that's, this is an equilibrium reaction. 
how do we move that equilibrium to where we want to have it? What do we do? That's too early morning, maybe. How do you drive a reaction to one side? So if we have an equilibrium reaction, I don't know, maybe you have a mathematical approach. Then, you know, the equilibrium is the concentration of Hopeless with the lights. See, which one is it? Or can you see? You can still see the. I can keep on the lights. Yeah. Okay. So, if you have a mathematical approach, you know that the equilibrium constant is uh, the, the, the 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 division of the concentrations of products and the concentrations of the substrates. But maybe you have another approach how this goes from left to right. So, what do you do if you have an equilibrium? Can you change the concentrations? What happens if you change the concentration? Which concentrations can you change? Isopropanol concentration. Very good. Uh, so if we make this very, if we, it's a bit wobbly the screen. If we if we increase this concentration, we drive the reaction to the right. Yeah. Okay. How do you do this? You use isopropanol as a solvent. Yeah. Okay. So one thing is to add a lot of this one, and the other thing would be then of course. You know, you, want, you can't do much on the red ones because that's your substrate and your product. So if you want to drive the reaction from left to right and this is an equilibrium, you add either a huge amount of this one or you somehow remove the acetone, right? Okay. How can you remove the acetone? Oh, do you clean your glassware? You usually rinse it with acetone, don't you? Why acetone? Because it dissolves the grease and because it has a low boiling point. Yeah? So that's the same here. So if this has a low boiling point, and really the boiling point difference is about 20 25 degrees. So you run it in isopropanol reflux. So with the reflux, you bring this into the gas phase so that disappears. So, between the reactant, as you know, uh, the reactant ketone and the product ketone are not significant. <coughs> the boiling point difference between the reactant ketone and the product ketone. Ah, yes. Yeah, so, 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 the boiling point difference between this one and this one, you mean? Reactant ketone and product ketone. Between this one and this one. Yes. yes so, the, this one is the lowest boiling ketone we have. So, if this boils, this usually doesn't. Unless you need, you, the only danger you have is when you take ethyl methyl ketone. Uh, because then this is very similar. But that's, that's one substrate, you're a bit locked. Uh, but if you take anything that has here a larger R group or more than a methyl group here, the boiling point is 100 and more degrees. So no problem. Well, this one here nearly reaches Indian summer boiling points. Uh, so, okay. Um, ah, yes, if you, if you reflux, you have two effects. Huh? So one thing is if you reflux in isopropanol, so the refluxing is important. It's not just the temperature, it's also the refluxing, and that's more a practical thing. Uh, so if you, you, you can easily dissolve a gas in a solution, and the gas stays in solution. Uh, so each of your solutions contains nitrogen and oxygen um, um, and uh, maybe even carbon dioxide. 
and only when you reflux this gas goes out. So refluxing is not only a matter of heating up the solution, but refluxing is also a degassing operation. So you know, if isopropanol reflo uh, boils at 78 degrees and you keep your reaction at 78, there's just not enough reflux. So the acetone stays in the solution. It really has to bubble, and the more it bubbles, the more efficient your degassing is. And acetone is a gas in 80 degrees isopropanol. But you have to bubble. Uh, so I, uh, refluxing breaks the surface tension, and that is the uh, way to degas systems. Uh, so when you run such a reaction, don't just add heat, make sure it's properly refluxing because it's a degassing portion. It's also you deoxygenate it easily then. Huh? So yeah, you don't have to worry about things like uh, if, if you have an oxygen sensitive system, you can either degas with free uh, thaw thump um, uh, procedures or you just simply reflux because dioxygen has low solubility once you reflux. So, typically we need a base, we come back to this. Um, the advantage is that the reducing atmosphere is very mild. So you know in hydrogen, if you use a hydrogen atmosphere, you reduce more than possible, you have an overall reducing atmosphere. So your metal gets reduced, other uh, portion, uh, portions of the molecule may get reduced. Well, with iso with in, in this isopropanol catalyst mixture, you don't have dihydrogen produced, literally. Oh, you know, there's, uh, during transfer hydrogenation, you never have that reducing atmosphere. You're just in isopropanol. Sometimes you have a bit of a basic atmosphere. So there are three mechanisms. Um, that have been discussed for transfer hydrogenation. One is a very old one, the Mervine pondorf verley mechanism, which uses very simple salts. Um, and uh, this works best with compounds that have a very, or with metal precursors that have a very high oxophilicity. So that's um, very hard metals, aluminum, lanthanides. Uh, so um, 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 titanium, all those hard metals that are that have nearly that have almost no d electrons, that are um, in high oxidation state and hence have a high affinity for oxygen binding. And the mechanism there is that um, you form some sort of aluminum oxides. You know, all, everybody who has looked a bit into polymerization knows how poorly defined aluminum oxides are. Uh, so this is nothing like a molecular structure. This is some oligomer, some polymer, some cage, some uh, whatever structure. Aluminum with oxygen does, and plus it's very dynamic. Aluminum oxides are dynamic systems. They constantly coordinate, decoordinate. They form different structures, super ill-defined. But the basic active feature is this um, alkoxide hydroxide that is formed um, that can then interact with a ketone. So you have two oxygens binding to the same aluminum, and then they can undergo a, so, some sort of a six-membered transition state. I forgot here to draw the transition state. Uh, this is when the hydrogen is kind of swinging between the two carbon positions. This is truly the transition state. The hydrogen is not bound anymore to the donor source, but is um, already interacting with the acceptor. And then it can swap over, the product can be released, and this is all driven by first, in the reaction you have much more of the ketone than of this alcohol, so the reaction goes clockwise, plus you have much more isopropanol than acetone, so the second driver that um, makes the reaction go clockwise. So in any of these alux, aluminum oxide features, once the isopropoxide is coordinated, you get this feature here, then the ketone occasionally coordinates and you get Two key um, uh, um, characteristics for this reaction to happen. Your metal needs to be super oxophilic, A, and B, the hydride never touches the metal in these systems. And that's in agreement with these hard metals. Hydrides are relatively soft ligands, so there's little interaction. You know, we don't know of lanthanide hydrides, or of very few only. So with lanthanides, the hydride is not touching the metal, it goes straight from the carbon to the carbon by this six-member transition state. And you'd see, because this is, 
this reaction and this reaction are exactly the microscopic mirror images. Uh, so what you the bond you weaken here is the bond you strengthen here. The bonds you break here are the bonds you make here. So it's microscopically exactly the same process. As a consequence, this reaction is totally reversible. You do always the same type of procedures, and it's only driven by what we just discussed, what you proposed, by the fact that we remove the acetone, by the fact that we have isopropanol in excess. So you can easily drive it the other way around. You don't use isopropanol as a solvent, but a ketone. And once you use a ketone as a solvent, the whole reaction doesn't go clockwise, but it goes anti-clockwise, and that's what's called the open hour oxidation. So you can easily as well oxidize or dehydrogenate an alcohol with this, this method. Um, you need to be a bit careful because obviously you cannot use acetone as the acceptor because you lose then the possibility to work on the reflux. So usually this reaction is then performed with uh, cyclohexanone because the high cyclohexanone cyclohexanol couple has a, a boiling point difference of only one or two degrees. So you can provide energy into the system, but uh, you don't lose your um, acceptor. Um, then we have two more reactions, two more uh, mechanisms um, that are slightly distinct from each other. One is the monohydride mechanism and one is the dihydride mechanism. The dihydride mechanism works typically with metal centers that can easily change their oxidation state um, that have either a dihydride already at the starting point or a monohydride with a label ligand or a two ligands that are easily displaced and can, go, uh, uh, can undergo a reduction. So a classic would be something like um, ruthenium chloride hydride Phosphine. Uh, so here you have the metal center, you have the hydrogen. This one here can be displaced probably quite easily. So either you start from a low valent metal center and you have an oxidative addition. This is a different activation of isopropanol. Uh, in the previous slide I showed you the isopropoxide, so the deprotonated system that binds to the aluminum. Here it, this one here would be an oxidative addition. We see that we can as well shortcut this parameter here. You can enter that compound here as well by a salt metathesis if you use basic isopropanol. Uh, you can replace the chloride by isopropoxide very simply and you're at the same stage here. Then you get a beta hydrogen elimination. Uh, that hydrogen here is very susceptible. That's why I call it the CH activation of very reactive bonds. Here, you, this, this proton is easy, e, e, it's, it's very close. It's activated through the oxygen and activated through the four member transition state that we can form for beta hydrogen elimination. So we lose acetone and we now have a, a dihydride uh, component. And this dihydride can now interact with a ketone. The ketone can bind migratory insert, and then we are at the same situation, but now, what did I do? Did I? Okay, I think we have a few signs today that we should probably stop class and that the lectures are over, you know. First, first the thing goes down and then the slides. I think soon the lights shut off and there's a coffee lorry coming in and maybe. <laughs> anyway, we try to keep it up. So maybe you can still guess a bit. Huh? So, so you get the isopropoxide formed, and then the isopropoxide can basically either reductively eliminate. Uh, maybe you recall there's still the, one of the hydrogens is bound to the metal center. So that either reductively eliminates to form uh, the product alcohol or you protonate it with some isopropanol and you have the exchange of the two reactions uh, of the two alcohols and you are back in that cycle. Now, one thing in this mechanism um, that we should keep in mind is that um, formally we form here the first hydride by an oxidative addition and the second hydride by a beta hydrogen elimination. So even so in isopropanol the hydrogens are polarized. Uh, so
in isopropanol, one hydrogen is more hydridic, it's more a hydride, and the other one is more protonic. So we formally have, in the extreme case, we deliver, don't deliver dihydrogen, but we dispatch a hydrogen, a hydride, and a proton. Um, th this identity is totally lost in this mechanism. Here, the two hydrides are both hydrides formally. They are equivalent. They have no no differentiation. And when the as when the ketone is uh, coordinating, um, it is indifferent whether it's this hydrogen or that hydrogen that insert. Well, whether the should be correct whether the ketone inserts into this bond or that bond. Uh, it's the ketone that migrates. It's not the hydride that migrates. So we have this swap here that is at random. It's a, the hydride can end up uh, oxygen bound or carbon bound, the proton can end up carbon bound or hydrogen. This is different in the monohydride mechanism, which is slightly different because we now only need one coordination, um, uh, uh, one vacant coordination site at the metal center, basically. We don't, well, well we can, you see, we can skip this almost. Here we have a halide or a easy displaceable group at the metal center. Um, we add our isopropoxide, which is formed from KOH and isopropanol. Um, uh, and we form this isopropoxide that undergoes a beta hydrogen elimination. So now the proton is captured very early on by the base. So we form H2O or whatever base you're using, tertiary butanol. And we get this hydride. That hydride can undergo a uh, can insert the product key uh, the, the substrate ketone to form this isopropoxide, uh, this alkoxide, which can or cannot go via such a state. We have quite some evidence, and I think you guys have too, that we don't need too many coordination sites, or this can only free up very, very, very rapidly. So we can easily start with, say, five coordinate metal centers and still it works. So either that system goes quickly to a seven coordinate system to coordinate the isoprop, uh, to coordinate the ketone, then the hydride points in, or actually the ketone directly inserts into the metal hydride bond, we don't know. But anyhow, you have access to this system here, and then we have again the protonation, deprotonation. So this alkoxide is protonated by the isopropanol, and we get the alkoxide, the, the isopropoxide back, and we can start the cycle. And you see again, there's a mirror image here. It's not nicely drawn, um, but there's a mirror image here. There's the hydride. So this would be the central piece. And we get ketone decoordination, um, ketone coordination. But the consequence of this monohydride mechanism is clear. Um, it's always the hydridic carbon, like in the mervine pondorf reaction, it's the hydridic carbon that is selectively transferred to the carbonyl carbon, and it's the proton that moves from one oxygen to the oxygen to the oxygen. So the transfer is selective, so you can easily probe this. And the classic way to probe it is to use isotope labeling. So you start either from um, polydeuterated uh, isopropanol or you use cyclohexanone that you can easily reduce with lithium aluminum deuteride or borodeuterate. So you you deuterate this position and that position, you dissolve it, you do an aqueous workup or you dissolve it quickly in an alcohol, that exchanges the O8, the OD back to OH, and you have then the selective deuteroproto um, uh, substrate ketone. You run this as the dihydrogen source and you can distinguish very easily between the monohydride and the dihydride. Note that in the, so in the monohydride case, obviously the, uh, uh, the transfer is selective, so you should get 100% deuteration of the product carbonyl position. This is never 100% in practice, because you always have a bit of exchange, maybe here with some residual water, uh, maybe, maybe in the, even, the, uh, yeah, may, maybe here, but so, De facto, you, get, you end up with something like 90, 95%. But anyway, a clear cut depletion of hydrogen at this position. In the dihydrate route, you end up with 50%, and the other 50% formally end up here. 
But this you never see, of course, because you all know that the OH protons very rapidly exchange. So you know, when you start, when you produce this alcohol, and this is your solvent, this is a billion times excess, so you get a very, very small quantity actually of this one. Can you still see this? I can ask perhaps. Uh, so you get a very small quantity of the deteutrated isopropanol, which is so small that it doesn't enter the reaction mixture really. So in fact, you end up with 50% uh, of the deuterated product and 50% of the non-deuterated product, and the other 50% deuterium, they're, they're wasted in the solvent. But so you clearly can distinguish with this deuterium experiment whether you have a monohydride or a dihydride root. Yeah? Um, there's a special case of the monohydride root which is very um, uh, uh, reminiscent of the dihydrogen activation that we've seen where the ligand cooperates. So uh, these type of systems like Noyori's catalyst, they don't only, are, uh, they're fantastic because they're not only working as dihydrogen activator but also as transfer hydrogenation activator. They have uh, the ruthenium as a Lewis acidic site and here the ligand NH as a Lewis basic site. Uh, there's a lone pair on this nitrogen still and this lone pair can capture the proton of the OH here and at the same time start to remove the hydride that is then activated if the proton is coordinating to um, form the ruthenium hydride. So you can dehydrogenate isopropanol with this complex very easily to form the hydride amine compound and you'd see the metal doesn't change its oxidation state. Here the nitrogen is anionic and the solvent is a neutral ligand. Here the hydride is anionic and the nitrogen is a neutral ligand. So you stay isohypsic, there's no change in coordination uh, or in oxidation state of the metal center, but you formally dehydrogenate um, uh, uh, isopropanol. And by the same process you can rehydrogenate the ketone, and again, if the equilibria are properly managed, you get this reaction in one way selectively. Um, this is again an outer sphere mechanism because as in the keto, uh, in the olefin case, you see here that the ketone never ever touches the metal center. There's no direct interaction. The ketone doesn't enter the inner coordination sphere, the first coordination sphere of the metal center. So that's why this is called inner sphere. A very prominent feature, species for this is the Schwa catalyst. Schwa catalyst is a dimeric structure um, that formally consists of a ruthenium 2 and a ruthenium 0 species, but you'd see this is totally symmetric, so um, in fact it's a ruthenium-1, ruthenium-1 in stable resting state, but as soon as you have a substrate, this system breaks up, and it breaks up heterolytically, so you cleave, you put the two hydrogens both to the same metal center, so what you end up with is a CP analog, where this CP is anionic, the hydride is anionic, so this is a ruthenium-2 species that has here a proton and here a hydride. And the other part of the molecule is a ruthenium-0 species where you have a cyclopentadiene on species which is neutral, empty coordination site, two carbonyls. So you see this is made up for scavenging dihydrogen, so this can undergo the same type of interaction here where the ruthenium binds the hydride, the oxo binds the proton, so you form the ketone and actually this compound. And this compound here can dehydrogenate, uh, can hydrogenate, can re, uh, um, uh, donate this formal dihydrogen to make the ketone. This is a super fast compound and you'd see that um, you have in one molecule, you have both the dihydrogen donor and the dihydrogen acceptor. So this, if you add to this compound just an alcohol, this alcohol is converted constantly because you form 50% of this which dehydrogenates the alcohol and you form 50% of this. So as soon as the alcohol is dehydrogenated, it gets hydrogenated again. So if you don't manage your reaction with a solvent, the alcohol is just, or same for the ketone, the ketone is hydrogenated and dehydrogenated. 
Now for alcohols, this is interesting because if you take a chiral alcohol, uh, this chiral alcohol immediately gets to the ketone, the ketone binds back to this one, and so in no time, your alcohol is racemized. Ah, you may think, of course, that's the most stupid reaction I've ever told. Uh, uh, everybody wants to do asymmetric catalysis, builds very magic ligands to make the uh, uh, EE as high as possible. And here I advocate for a catalyst that in no time destroys all that, pro uh, that, that product again. Uh, back, and you have only chiral alcohol. We'll see in a second how useful this can be. Uh, so actually this is very interesting that you have here a catalyst that is super fast in racemizing alcohols. First quickly, uh, classic R, yes. So there's very high, uh, uh, high very potent transfer hydrogenation catalysts now. As I've shown you for, di for the direct hydrogenation, we get here turnover frequencies that are excellent. Oh, we have these lizards there. There is many. There's many? Yeah. I've never seen lizards in my lectures. That's nice. Maybe they're more spellbound by the dehydrogenation than, than I thought. Anyway. So, uh, uh, activity is extremely high. But unlike dihydrogenation, direct hydrogenation, here typically turnover numbers don't go magic. They don't go that high. So these reactions, they have super high turnover frequencies because they're over in a minute, or even less. Now, um, why don't we have high turnover numbers? There are two aspects uh, that we should consider. One is a bit uh, um, one I'd say is poorer understood. And that is when we start lowering the catalyst concentration. So when we go to lower and lower catalyst loading, there is somewhere a sharp barrier. You know, you can lower it to 0.1%, 0.001%, and you get a constant the classic um, drop in activity, but increase in turnover numbers that you expect. You know, the less catalyst, the slower the reaction should go. But then suddenly there's a gap. And that's probably because the isopropanol starts to do a side reaction. Maybe there's some impurity in the isopropanol that completely shuts down. So what we op often observe in transfer hydrogenation is that we can lower the catalyst concentration to a certain level, but then we get totally inactive species at a further lowering. And so we think there's a, this, there's a, there's a decomposition reaction that becomes so relevant that everything um, uh, goes down. It may be the base, it may be the isopropanol, it may be an impurity in the isopropanol. But you know, with, if, if there's none such side effect, you can lower and you just have to be more patient so you get higher turnover numbers. But with uh, transfer hydrogenation, and this may be uh, due to the presence of the hydrides, at some point this is over. And you just, uh, it's really dead and you can be as patient as you want, there's no reaction. The other thing is that um, the transfer hydrogenation has, if you look at the uh, catalytic mechanisms, you have no resting state that is stable. You know, the hydrides, they're not very stable. They tend to decompose. The alkoxides, they always go beta hydrogen elimination. And we have the same with the monohydride species. So there's no, the, the, the complex that we form at the beginning is irreversibly formed. So catalyst activation in, in um, transfer hydrogenation is typically irreversible. So most of the time, once you have consumed all your substrate, the catalyst is lost. It cannot do anything, so all the, Degra degradation and deactivation mechanisms become uh, most prominent and so you deplete your activity. So that's one of the reasons why even if you have very high turnover frequencies, there's no resting state that is stable enough. So once the reaction re uh, re reaches 90, 95%, you start getting decomposition of your active species, and that's irreversible. So if after two minutes you have your reaction completed, you add more substrate, the substrate won't be converted because your active species is lost. So that's one of the disadvantages, of, um, or one of the, how should I say, one of the challenges that we need young, smart people like you guys to sort it eventually. Um, so what's the purpose of having a very uh, productive um, uh, racemization? 
One thing is, uh, this has been applied in one um, case by, um, or in one case, in one concept and many cases actually, in the so-called dynamic kinetic resolution. And this is very interesting if you have a racemic mixture of products, but you're interested only in one enantiomer. So the classic case is that, uh, you know, you form the racemate and you do the Pasteur type separation of the two enantiomers, you get one enantiomer pure, the other enantiomer is lost because it's waste, you cannot use it. So what would be much nicer is to actually convert that other enantiomer into the desired one. But that's a hell of a job if you do this selectively, uh, because making asymmetric catalysts is uh, very tedious and very unpredictable, I have to say. Uh, often a very small change makes a huge effect and it's not always that we understand the effect. And that has been very nicely put. Oh, we'll make a break in a second. I explain you quickly the dynamic and then we do the break. So what does dynamic kinetic resolution do? Dynamic kinetic resolution makes sure that you have constantly a 50-50% mixture. So with this Schwab catalyst, there's never an excess of one enantiomer, which is good because if we separate one enantiomer from the other one, the other one is not in pure form because it's immediately racemized back to the mixture. So if we couple such a racemization catalyst with a catalyst that converts one enantiomer selectively, we have a very neat system. So that's what uh, peptides are doing, enzymes are doing. So for example, this lipase is selectively uh, esterifying um, this, this alcohol, so the S alcohol, but not the R alcohol. So what do we have? This is extreme, uh, and enzymes are extremely um, selective. So if we have a 50-50 mixture of, um, of these two alcohols, the lipase uh, converts fast and selectively this alcohol leaves this one untouched. So if we look at this, this sequence compartmentalized, we have, after a short time, we have zero of this and still 50% of this alcohol. Now that's where Schwarz catalyst comes into the game. Schwarz catalyst makes sure that these 50% are immediately racemized. So we have 25% of this, 25% of that. The lipase again takes those 25% off. It's gone to the alcohol. The 25% left over are racemized by Schwarz catalyst, and so you constantly deplete actually the undesired R alcohol with Schwarz catalyst, because you constantly end up with a 50-50%. And eventually, eventually, all your racemic mixture ends up selectively at this, uh, at this ester. So it's actually here a thing where we avoid the this uh, discovery of a selective catalyst, we can use one that is already known and we just make sure that we have constantly a racemic mixture of starting materials and then we end up with high purity, high uh, enantiomeric excess uh, of one product only. So that's one version where we can um, profit a lot by, uh, by a racemization catalyst and use it productively to get one enantiomer only. We break up we continue a bit on the reversibility types of reactivities with carbonyls. The nice thing about transfer hydrogenation is that you can form these carbonyls, but in a transient manner. So you can dehydrogenate an alcohol, you form the carbonyl, you can work with the carbonyl, and then you can rehydrogenate it. And this can be applied in transfer hydrogenation. And you can make tandem, you can form tandem reactions, which become very powerful. So one approach that you see here is the alkylation of an alcohol in the beta position, not in the alpha position. So if I just show you this first reaction and tell you, you know, this is your starting material, this is your product, how would you do it? Organic chemists, just from scratch, would have a terribly hard time. This would be a five, six step procedure to get there an alkyl group. You know, this is not a very active CH3 group, uh, well, how do you alkylate? What alkylating agent do you use? Methyl iodide? Well, whatever. So transfer hydrogenation has here a very elegant way and that's just to tell you how catalysis can really make processes very, very sustainable. So you add an alcohol, two alcohols, and you 
oxidize them both. If you use a proper catalyst, your dihydrogen is not forming, or your, your, the, the reduction does not form dihydrogen, but the dihydrogen stays stored in the metal coordination sphere. So here's one of uh, the catalysts that can do this, there's others, so you can form, with iridium catalysts, you form, with this one here, you form an iridium dihydride. You reduce your alcohol to the ketone, you form an iridium dihydride. So that the hydrogen is stored at iridium. Because you do this under basic conditions, you form the ketone and the aldehyde. Because this is basic, now you see that this ketone here um, has a functional group that is very susceptible to base. Uh, the alpha protons of ketones are always very acidic. So, in the presence of a base, in the presence of the iridium, you dehydrogenate. In the presence of a base, you accelerate this dehydrogenation and you deprotonate this carbon here. And you get aldol condensations. This aldol condensation, this carbanion attacks the aldehyde, which is more reactive than the ketone. So you form uh, the aldol enone product. Huh? So this dehydrates and you form this enone. You're familiar with aldol condensations. Okay. So this loses the, uh, water, this uses water and you form this enone. And now the iridium hydride comes into the game again because the dihydrogen stays in your solution. So the dihydrogen hydrogenates with iridium as the catalyst, you have a rehydrogenation both to the double bond and to the key to both double bonds because remind, remember here we lose, lose two hydrogens, here we lose two hydrogens, so we have formally lost four hydrogens. These four hydrogens are re-added to, the to, the, to this intermediate here and you form the alcohol. So in a very elegant one pot procedure, very mild conditions, no protecting groups, no, um, no waste literally formed, you form in one step this alkylated alcohol. Very convenient. Tell me. There is an acidic hydrogen in the reactant. Here. So, uh, there. Yep. There. In the original reactant, the two alcohols. Yes, these two. Ah. So, won't the acid base reaction precede transfer of the hydrogenation? Sorry? One? First of all, the acid base reaction should happen. There is a base in the reagent. Ah, yes, but the alcohol, uh, this acid base reaction doesn't happen because the pK is wrong. So it only, ha uh, well, it happens for initiating the catalytic activity. It happens at the very entrance of the catalytic cycle. Here, it happens here. You get one equivalent of this one, but then the other uh, protons are always dispatched to the product. Uh, but the, if you use if you use KOH as the base, um, the deprotonation of the alcohols doesn't happen because the pKa of this guy here is lower than the pKa of the alcohol. Huh? The alkoxide is a stronger base than the OH. So this reaction here, bah, the formation of this guy here is a minor quantity. But we only need little because we have only very little catalyst. So the base really reacts with this proton here. This is way more acidic than actually this one here. Or this one here reacts if it's deprotonated reaction. Yeah. But so we get very high yields. Our byproduct in this reaction is um, water. But other than that, we have no waste. Huh? So there's, this is a carbon neutral, an oxygen neutral, no additives. We just need our iridium catalyst to run this alkylation in a very smooth way. So nothing associated with producing um, very active alkylating agents. Oh, methyl iodide, you have to produce it. So you need HI to produce it and methanol. Not very convenient. And you form for each event, you form a equivalent of iodide as a waste product. Not good. So, this is a very sustainable reaction, if you like. And you can do other reactions, like with this guy here. And you'd see this is a very elegant um, um, outer sphere process, basically, where you have a ruthenium alkyl 
group that is connected together. This is now the carbon ion that can take the proton. The ruthenium takes the hydride. And in the presence of an alcohol, you form, you, you open this metallic cycle, you form the isopro uh, isopropyl group and the ruthenium hydride. The other hydride is a spectator ligand. So even so, this compound looks like it undergoes a dihydride mechanism. One hydride doesn't react at all. You do transfer dehydrogenation of the alcohol under basic conditions. You open up that metallic cycle. You store the dihydrogen in this um, ruthenium carbon bond, if you like. You form the ketone under basic conditions. This phosphine becomes a Wittig reagent. You make a Wittig reaction. You form the olefin. Now the olefin is activated. Huh? So this is an uh, electron withdrawing group. Now, because this is activated, it releases, it captures the dihydrogen that is stored in the catalyst, and you alkylate, uh, you you pro hydrogenate the double bond, and you form this nitro. So basically, you have a very nice um, functional group transformation. Again, one step. Again, very. Um, sustainable, no magic transformations. Of course, in Wittig reagents, you always form an equivalent of phosphine or phosphine oxide that is left over as some sort of waste, but that's the Wittig reaction. But other than that, there's no functional group manipulation needed. You look, you take an alcohol, you transiently form it into an active species, the carbonyl, and you then react. If you use, instead of the nitrile, uh, a metoxy. Ah, yes. So you use a metoxy group and the Wittig reagent. No, in some other reason, suppose I change the functional group from nitrile to some electron group. Yes. So somehow we activate that double bond. Yes. So the yes. So the metoxy group. Yes. So don donating groups deactivate principally the hydride transfer. I didn't mention. Uh, so I should have shown you a table maybe. Um, if you look at, if you look at uh, the transfer hydrogenation, you can do whole series. Uh, so a very easy one. <coughs> is to start modifying the R group here um, and see how fast the reaction goes. Uh, you use a catalyst, uh, isopropanol or whatever hydrogen source this is, the same holds for formic acid. And you look at the rates. And you see that uh, Turnover frequencies are faster when you have an electron withdrawing group on the on the phenyl group as opposed to an electron donating. Uh, you have done the same, no? You see the opposite. So maybe you have a different mode. Here is one. So what do we have here? So that's the benzene, the chloro, the phenyl. Ah, here we get steric. Ah, that's not so an electronic one. I should show you another one. Are we seeing many cases with us that actually electron withdraw? Huh? Ah, you do, ah, 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 so we're consistent. Ah, in your dehydrogenation, yes, 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 ah, ah, I'm relieved, I'm relieved. Where is my, ah, then I'm relieved. Your dehydrogenation, ah, ha, ha, ha. So why is this? You know, so in the hydrogenation, you get, you know, the issue here is the hydride transfer. So how quick does this mix together? 
So you see this is a hydride, so the more electropositive this uh, group is, the easier the hydride transfers. So the more I deplete here electron density, the more electropositive this guy gets, this, this position here becomes, so the faster the hydride transfer is. And of course, in your case, this is the opposite because you want to remove it. So the more donating, the more the proton, uh, the hydride disappears. Ah, <laughs> I thought you're talking about the same. So though maybe you have a totally different transition state. Well, again, you know, what, what do we have here? Here we have a transfer of a hydride to, um, to well, this is an electron withdrawing group, so this becomes positive, negative, so it's the same, yes? You know, whether it's a polarized CC bond or a CO bond, it's the same. Having a weak day today. So if this is an electron withdrawing group, we have here delta minus, delta plus, delta minus, delta plus. So hydride transfer can go here or here. Now the nitriles, this would be So now this bond is fairly resistant to hydrogenation, so we only have this one here to look at. And the more electropositive this is, the easier the hydride transfer goes. Whether we use a ketone or any other polarized unsaturated bond doesn't matter. It's the same concept. And so we can, for, and I didn't mention this really for transfer hydrogenation, double bonds, so there have been only few Olefins um, used as substrates for transfer hydrogenation. In fact, very few. And this is not, this is not a classic transfer hydrogenation, but it is. But uh, like three, four years ago, there, uh, we haven't seen any. So then we started looking at this. Others too. And we see that it works even for un for unfunctionalized or very poorly functionalized double bonds. So we can, we have systems where we can also transfer hydrogenate um, octene. Not very fast, but we can. Octene and as well three octene, four octene, so an in, in, uh, internal double bond. Um, but, but principally it works of course much faster if you have polarized double bonds. So the more polarized the double bond is, the faster the reaction is because you don't transfer two hydrides or two hydrogens, but you transfer a hydride and a proton. So the, the more polarized it is, the, the more this matches the reagents. So here you have delta minus delta plus, here you have a delta minus delta plus. So, and it's this hydride that propels the reaction. And you remember from the cycle, the protonation comes last. So it's the hydride shift that we have to manipulate. If we dehydrogenate, we have to make the thing as departureable as possible. So electron donating groups help to do this. If we hydrogenate, we have to make that carbon as electropositive as possible so that the hydride wants to stick on it. But that's because the hydride is the critical portion to be moved, removed, or added, added. And maybe we can uh, just see whether we can apply what we're having there. And maybe for some of you this is totally trivial, then maybe you can tell those, uh, for those that it's not so trivial, um, maybe have a chat with your neighbors, with your colleagues, tell me whether you get stuck. But so the question is, uh, if we have those three catalysts, or these three complexes, I should say, not really catalysts. There should be, there should be A, B, or C. Note that only this one here works with a base. This one doesn't work with a base. This one doesn't work with a base. So propose a mechanism, draw key intermediates, transition states that are relevant um, for this transfer hydrogenation. Tell me what you would expect if we use this deuterated isopropanol instead of the normal isopropanol, what will be the outcome? Tell me if this is trivial and if you all know and you yawn and you say okay. 
then we can talk about more interesting things if you think. If this is not trivial, let me know. If this is impossible to tackle, let me know too. Uh, so the question is, can we predict a bit what mechanism is operational? Can we support that mechanism by this, maybe by other, um, uh, uh, other probes as well? So maybe tackle one, maybe we can make like groups, like you're the left wing party, you're talking with C. So work first on compound C. Maybe the front part works first with A and the back part first with compound B. And then whoever has a proposal, so the spokesman of each party goes and puts down the proposal, and then the other two parties can vote whether that's consistent or not consistent. Does it make sense? So what did I say, you're A? Yes, sir. Say? Let's see, I'm done. We'll see you're done. Good, so you check on them. They will write the proposal down and you tell them whether you're accepting or not. Okay? We'll see you're done. So maybe you, you just go for a coffee break in two seconds. If you're done with that, um, uh, with the catalyst, maybe I can put up the screen so we have place to write down um, what you propose. So one guy can draw the thing on the table. <laughs> what did I say? Your C. In the first case, no. You are A or C? Okay. You have a plan? Yeah, but uh, in that step, uh, if we did not, did not use base, mm -hmm. then how? And how my isopropyl will activate? Ah. So, how isopropanol will be activated? Ah, that's a possibility. So, how do you get it? But, uh, so, how do you get. Uh, so you have the ketone and then you have? Yes. Then Where is the hydrogen transfer? From here to here. From here to here. So that's like the aluminum? It has So like the mervine pomdorf early mechanism, where you have the aluminum with the ketone and the alkoxide. Do you think ruthenium-2 is very oxophilic or a bit oxophilic? Or not so oxophilic? You, uh, you working with ruthenium? Hmm? No. What, what, what are you working uh, with? Palladium and uh, iridium. Palladium and iridium. Iridium 1, iridium 3. Yeah. Iridium 3. So is ruthenium 2 very similar or dissimilar from iridium 3 from palladium 2? Maybe a bit iridium 3? Maybe not so palladium 2, huh? Palladium 2D8, but the iridium 3, ruthenium 2, isoelectronic, huh? D6. Yeah? D6 octahedral, not too far. Is iridium 3 very oxophilic or a. Not that much. So I wouldn't think that the aluminum mechanism is ideal for the ruthenium. Having said this, we cannot exclude, huh? We cannot. It's a proposal, but it would not be my favorite. But why do you need to activate isopropoxide, uh, isopropanol? Yes. Okay. Now what ligands do you have bound to the ruthenium? One is an NH2, phosphine, the other one is So we have the NH2, we have the pyridine N, we have the carb anion, the aryl anion, we have the phosphine, we have the phosphine. That's it. That's possible. Um, I think the breaking up of a chelate is very energy demanding. Um, so because uh, the ligand disappearing, 
it, this comes with a penalty. Uh, chelation is a stabilizing force, and it's stabilizing because it's low energy. So principally, you can imagine that if you have a chelate, th th that electron density is always close to the metal center. So even if it decoordinates, it will come back. So the ketone is a very weak donor. So to replace something that is chelating by something that is weakly donating is very tough. It works in the pincer case that we've seen from Milstein, but in most of the cases it's more, uh, more penalized. So I, I, I suggest to keep that in H2 there. Now the good thing is that you can do this all, you see it when, we, when they write down. You can generate the hydride here even without the ketone coordinated. Huh? So the, a beta hydrogen elimination sub, forms the hydride and you keep that tridentate and the spidentate and then you have the hydride. Now you have little room for a bulky for ketone to coordinate. But it doesn't need to coordinate because you have a hydride here and a proton here. And then uh, recall that we talked about the outer sphere mechanism. So where the ketone doesn't even have to be close to the ruthenium, it has to be close to the hydride and the proton. And if they're properly aligned, Excuse me. With? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, yes, it can actually, it can start losing much more. Huh? So first, lanthanides can go very high in coordination number. And second, the HCl can be easily diffused. Huh? So that can go. Okay. You guys are agreeing with... So you, you made C, huh? Yeah? Did you also look at A? That is in H2 in your coordination. Say? That is, that will not with the I had a bell ringing. The uh, NH2? Will not with the because So your suggestion is that this nitrogen will go away? Yeah. Okay. We had that discussion at a few other places, that the NH2 is actually a label ligand. Um, usually, this is not the case. So, so, having said this, yes, this could happen. Huh? It could principally happen. But in most cases, chelation is a strong driving force. It's very difficult to break up chelates unless the chelate donor and the metal are hearts of acid base mismatch. Now, in this case, it's even more difficult because the ligand is all in one plane. Because of the, uh, what's, whatever the name is, the, of the, the ligand, uh, so this is totally closed planner, that arm cannot move too far away. So decoordination means the nitrogen goes only a bit away, but it stays very close. So to replace it with a ketone may come with quite some penalty. So it's not impossible, but like I'd say this mechanism is not impossible. It would not be my favorite, nor the decoordination would be my favorite, because the decoordination is, that, that just comes always with penalty. It doesn't come with some penalty in the Milstein system, but there maybe that hydride puts enough density on that there's not much donors uh, needed. Here, not so convinced. So I would be happy with the beta hydrogen elimination. But then you had another idea for this. 
So maybe you take a red pen or a blue pen and write your idea just at the side. Here, lanthanides, did somebody look at the lanthanide mechanism? You can draw. Uh, so there may be more than one HCl removed. We get the alkoxide and we get the classic, this mervine pomdor furley interaction where the ketone and the alkoxide are are coordinating at the same time. The hydrogen can whop over. There's the six-member transition state. We get back to, yeah? This one here. We form the alkoxide. The alkoxide coordinates beta hydrogen. We get the dihydride. Dihydride coordinates the ketone migratory insertion. And then either we have the protonation or we could have as well reductive elimination to ruthenium zero. Oxidative addition goes here. In the beta hydrogen elimination? Uh, yes, possibly. But uh, we're talking here about the transition state. Yes, not it's this is not an intermediate. Is, is uh, does this cause a problem for you? A seven tra uh, coordinate transition state. Okay, so let me ask you another question. Um, is a five coordinate carbon transition state something that is sterically crowded? A five coordinate carbon. Yeah. So a five coordinate carbon transition state, I, I would have more problems with five coordinate carbon than with the seven coordinate ruthenium. As a transition state even. Are we talking about transition states? Because there's, I know only of one five coordinate carbon that has some stability. That's CH5 plus. Huh? acids can protonate methane, but only methane. So five coordinate carbons, but then we accept them as transition states all the time. Every SN2 is a five coordinate carbon. No problem. For seven coordinate ruthenium, we actually have stable complexes crystallized and everything. Uh, so seven coordinate, uh, you know, and if you look at all transition metal chemistry, um, look at ligand substitutions. Ligand substitutions at the octahedral metal center. Is it always dissociative? No, many, many associative. Associative means seven coordinate transition state. So no problem, seven coordinate. And we're only talking about transition state. Right? The beta hydrogen elimination, that's only in a transition state, both are kind of binding. That works, no problem. We have many examples. Could be, could be. Could be that in the transition state, the nitrogen decoordinates and recoordinates. Could be, totally. Will be extremely hard to um, monitor unless you have some femtosecond lasers or attosecond lasers or whatsoever. Huh? But it becomes semantics then. If the Is it actually? Which one? Anyway, you get the hydride and you get there. Now the thing is, can you read this? So, the fact is that you have a proton on the nitrogen and you have a hydride on the metal center. And then you get what you suggested, it can go out the sphere. 
but I think you had it too early. You had it in the hydrogen donor with the... Uh, but then it went exactly that way. Huh? So once you have this, you can easily consider that here... Russia. A ketone has the opposite polarity and you get exactly that transition state here, which then forms the ruthenium A mix with here either uh, so a solvent or whatever empty coordination site and then the isopropanol can coordinate back and you get this this system. Maybe you don't get this one then, huh? Maybe you're straight here. Uh, because you get the NH coordinated to ruthenium So that's the... The OH gets abstracted by the nitrogen, the hydride gets accepted by the ruthenium. So you have the isopropoxide only at the beginning as a capped hydride, forms the hydride, gets to that intermediate this transition state, will get replaced by another one of these they click on and you're back to this one here. Here we have the Mervine Pomdor Furley, who we said that could as well go through the ruthenium zero. So what's the effect of the deuterated isopropanol? In this case, do we keep some deuterium or do we lose it all? There's no scrambling. So, what was the product? Acetophenone. So, almost. Yeah? Happy? Good. She's happy, we're all happy, at least with this one. Okay, here? Questions or oppositions, demonstrations, bombs, no bombs. That's okay. That was difficult, not so. A bit. Good. So we'll do more cyclometallation, other CH activations tomorrow. Or you're sick and tired of CH activations. You can always do more carbene chemistry if you prefer. Do first some CH activation. Good. So we stop it here. Do. Is there some water? Or. Uh, oh yeah, but that's a bit precious water for washing my hands. Is there a. Uh, is there a a bathroom downstairs or outside. Now this, by the way, doesn't need to be.